Hey guys, I would like to start with a statement from a founding father that we used to memorize in school for nearly two centuries. It's a statement from George Washington. The statement from George Washington comes from his farewell address. And amazingly, in schools from the time of Washington until up through about World War II, we studied George Washington's farewell address. We looked at it as the guide for how to keep America on track. So going to George Washington here in a minute. Guys, we're not going on the slides yet. Are they coming up? Temporary timeout. Got it? Ah, there we go. So with George Washington, uh, this is his farewell address delivered in 1796. This is one of the biggest warnings he gave in it. He said, of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity. Now, I would argue we don't have much political prosperity today. We're very divided. We're very polarized. We're very weaponized. There's nothing that would indicate political prosperity. But he said, of all the habits and dispositions that lead to political prosperity, he said, religion and morality are indispensable supports. So if you want religion and politics, or excuse me, if you want political prosperity, you have to promote religion and morality. The next statement he said was very strong. He said, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars. So from his standpoint, he said, guys, if you want things to work well in the government, you've got to promote religion and morality. And he said, I'm just telling you, I know a patriot when I see one. I had him at Valley Forge. I had him eight years in the Revolution. Anyone who tries to remove the influence of religion and morality in the culture is not a patriot. Don't let them call themselves a patriot. Now, that's a pretty strong litmus test on patriotism. This is not what we've been hearing since the 60s particularly. What happened in the 60s was this Supreme Court case in 1962, Ingle Vitale. The Supreme Court, for the first time in court's history, it said, we're not going to allow voluntary school prayer. And by the way, I've been involved in 13 cases of the U.S. Supreme Court. The court didn't take out just school prayer. The court took out voluntary school prayer. We said, we, we don't even care if it's voluntary. We don't want you playing, praying in a public arena. So they took out voluntary school prayer. The next year in 63, in Abbott and Shemp, Murray Curlett, the court took out Bible reading. Now, we've had Bible reading since the first public school law was passed in America in 1647. So we've been going 320 years with Bible reading as part of American education, and the court said, no, we're not doing that. So what the court did said, you know, we used to use the First Amendment. We're not doing that anymore. And what happens is we don't even know the authority for the basis uh, of the decisions. This man is a guy named Benjamin Rush. He's a signer of the Declaration. John Adams said he's one of the three most influential founding fathers. He signed the Declaration. He ratified the Constitution, served in three different presidents and administrations. But for our purposes now, he, what's significant is he's called the father of public schools under the Constitution. This is the guy who helped set up public schools once the Constitution was in place. It's amazing that in 1791, he wrote this piece. He gave a dozen... Re uh, back up. I think he's just advancing on his own. He wrote this piece. It gave a dozen reasons why we would never take the Bible out of public schools. Now, here's a founding father. This is part of his explanation. He said, the great enemy of the salvation of man, in my opinion, never invented a more effectual means of extinguishing Christianity from the world than by persuading mankind that it was improper to read the Bible in schools. So this is the father of public schools said, guys, we'll never get to a point where we take the Bible out of schools. And if we ever reach that point, you're going to see a real decline in Christianity. Now, it's significant because we've reached that point, And we had a Supreme Court decision in 1844. That, court, that decision was called Vidal versus Gerard's Executors. And it dealt with a school in Philadelphia, a public school, government-funded school, that decided it was not going to do religion in school, not going to have ministers, wasn't going to do the Bible. In an 8-0 unanimous Supreme Court decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, 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 if you get government funding, you will do the Bible in schools. We're not going to fund a government school that won't do the Bible. Now, most of us have never heard that history before, but that was the decision in, in 44. And it goes back to something Benjamin Rush said. Benjamin Rush said, the Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of life. Now, that's a fairly strong statement. We can now prove that. And by the way, we know that the younger you are when you start reading the Bible, the more likely it is to stay a lifelong habit. So we don't have that habit now. The American Bible Society was founded back in 1816 by a number of founding fathers. Benjamin Rush actually founded the very first Bible Society in America. But if you look at their report from 2022, two years ago, the American Bible Society distributes hundreds of millions of Bibles a year. They're the largest Bible Society in the world. The American Bible Society documented that in 2022, we had a serious decline in Bible reading. It just plummeted. We lost 25 million Americans who no longer read the Bible at all. In one year, 25 million Americans don't read the Bible at all. 
that's not good for political prosperity because that's not good for religion and morality. If you look at last year's report, 2023, we saw a second decline last year. We saw another 3 million who stopped reading the Bible. So in the last two years, we've had 28 million Americans who no longer even crack the book. They don't even know what the Bible says. They don't read it. They don't open that book. So when you look at where we are with Bible reading, this biblical literacy has caused us some serious problems in a number of areas. Um, if, you, if you go back, for example, to what Washington said about religion and morality brings political prosperity, just think about political prosperity today compared to even a generation ago. Let me take you back to President, uh, President Franklin, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Now, he's a liberal progressive Democrat. Nobody contests that. Nobody questions that. I want you to see what this liberal progressive Democrat said about the Bible. This is what President Roosevelt said. He said, in the formative days of the Republic, the directing influence of the Bible exercised on the fathers of the nation is conspicuously evident. How many textbooks can you point to today where the influence of the Bible and the founding fathers is conspicuously evident? And yet, just a generation ago, liberal progressive Democrats are saying, guys, we all understand the Bible is what is the most important influence on the founders. That's what made America. Now, today, we have no clue that that's the way it was. But this is what he said. And so what would be the evidence? What would be the proof that the Bible had any influence back on the founding fathers? If you look at that document, that constitution, there's been 5,800 years of history. There's been thousands of nations, hundreds of constitutions. Cornell University Law School said, hey, what is the length of an average constitution in the history of the world? So they went back over the 5,800 years, thousands of nations, hundreds of constitutions, and they found the average length of a constitution was 17 years. This year, we celebrate 237 years in one year. Now, not many Americans have the appreciation for America they should have. We've been taught to despise the nation, dislike it, that we're fundamentally flawed, that we've been flawed from the very beginning, and yet we have something no other nation's had. We want to give that up because we have so many flaws. This is what we've had a steady diet of for a number of years. Significantly, the University of Houston said, okay, what's the source of their ideas? Because they've come up with a document here that's lasted longer than it's a world record. Every year is a world record for America. On cost. So where'd they get their ideas? And they said, well, we think... If we go back to the guys who wrote the Constitution, the guys to the Constitution, if we go to the guys who wrote the Constitution, and, and if we look at their writings and see who they quoted when they're writing the Constitution, we'll know where they got their ideas. Brilliant, brilliant thought. So what they did was they found 15,000 writings out of the founding era. Of those 15,000 writings, they identified 3,154 direct quotes in those writings. They said, now, we found the quotes, we found who they're quoting. If we can take the quotes back and find the source of the quotes, we'll know where they got their ideas. And they did that. It took them, it took them a total of 10 years to do that. At the end of 10 years, they released their results. This is an academic book you can get anywhere. This book, The Origin of American Constitutionalism, they said, we now know the single most cited individual in the period when we were recruiting American government. The single most cited individual is Baron Charles Montesquieu. In 1750, he wrote a two-volume set called The Spirit of the Laws. This is where we learned a lot about separation of powers. The second most cited individual was, was Judge William Blackstone, 1766 to 1769. He did a four-volume commentary on the laws. The third most cited individual was John Locke. He did the two treatises of government. Those are the three most cited individuals. The single most cited source in the records of the American founding was the Bible. 34% of all the quotes came out of the Bible. Now, you won't hear that today. As a matter of fact, if I say the Bible was the single greatest influence on the American founding, I'm a Christian nationalist. No, no, no. I'm simply reporting the academic research that's been done by decades. I'm not a Christian nationalist. I'm just telling you this is what made America special, and this is what's been documented. It's that we don't know our own history well enough to even defend this position at this point. Now, if you take, if you take that those unique ideas we talk about and go back to what President uh, Franklin Roosevelt said. He said, look, it's evident. It, it's conspicuous. The Bible is what shaped the founders of the republic. He continued. He says, we cannot read the history of our rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible's occupied in shaping the advance of the republic. He said, guys, we can't even look at history without recognizing that when we got it right, it was because of the Bible. Let me just give you one example. Uh, if you take the due process clauses, now this is this part of the Constitution that we call the due process clauses is the Fourth of the Eighth Amendment. It's all the legal rights that weren't being given in Europe or across the world at that time. Our founding fathers put them in place. 
And if you look at Federal Practice and Procedure today, Volume 30, and Federal Practice and Procedure is the law books you use to practice federal law, and it goes from here to the wall. It's a long volume. Look at Volume 30. It has 20 pages on how that our due process clauses in the Constitution came out of the Bible. For example, the right to confront your accuser came out of John 8.10. The right to compel witnesses in your behalf came out of Proverbs 18.17. The right to speak in your own defense, Acts 22.1, and on it goes. Most people today have no clue that our unique system of due process rights, which protects people more than any other system in the world, goes back to the Bible. If I take another president, Teddy Roosevelt, President Roosevelt said the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and so entwined with our civics and social life, it would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if these teachings were removed. He said if you take the teachings of the Bible out of America, you won't recognize our civic and our social life. He didn't say our spiritual life. He said, if you take the Bible teachings out, you won't even recognize the civic and social life? Like what? For example, if you look at, if you study economics, you'll find that America was the first nation in the last thousand years to come up with what we call the free market or the free enterprise system. You'll find that the first free market business was founded in Massachusetts in 1627, Aptucket, Massachusetts. And you'll find that that free market system, when they put it in Massachusetts, they'd been socialists, communitarians. They became free market people. Within two years, their economy had grown sevenfold. Prosperity is up seven times in two years. And it turns out they used five Bible verses. It's in their records. They used 1 Timothy 5, 8, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10, said we can't be socialistic anymore. Look what the Bible says. And they also used Matthew 25, Luke 19, and Matthew 20. Five economic teachings of the Bible that led to the free market system that's made us the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. So that's one thing we can point to. But he said civic and social institutions. How about things like our Republican form of government? You know, the Bible shows seven different forms of government. And the founding fathers, and particularly those of Plymouth, they said, which one do we want? Because you can have a monarchy, you can have an oligarchy, you can have all these different. And the one they chose was the first one mentioned in the Bible, Exodus 18.21. It's repeated in, Exodus, in, in Deuteronomy 1, 15 and 16, Deuteronomy 16, 18. God says, choose out from among you leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. First form of government given to the Hebrew Republic, he said, you guys choose your leaders. Choose your tens, fifties, choose your local, state, county, and federal. Choose able men such as fear of God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Choose such to rule in the fear of God. So Exodus 18.21 sets up a Republican form of government. That was the one we adopted in the Constitution. We are prohibited explicitly in the Constitution from becoming a democracy. That's one of the uh, forms of government in the Bible. The Founding Fathers used the Gospels to show how bad a democracy was because that's a lot of what the Romans had, and it's a bad form of government. So we're a Republican form of government. We're for prohibited by the Constitution from ever becoming a democracy. But we don't even know that today, and we don't know that it came specifically out of the Bible. So a lot of examples I can point to. I'll give you one more example from President Ulysses S. Grant as president in 1876 on the 100th anniversary of America. At that point in time, we turn 100 years old. He produced this card, and you see what it says, to the children and youth of the United States. So 1776, we're born. 1876, he's president. This is the message of President Grant to the kids. What is the president of the United States going to tell the kids of America? Here's what he said. He said, hold fast to the Bible as a sheet anchor of your liberties. Write its precepts in your hearts. Practice them in your lives. He says, to the influence of this book, we are indebted for all the progress made in true civilization. And to this, we must look as our guide in the future. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sins are reproach to any people. I don't care whether you take Trump or Biden. I don't care which president you take, Trump or Biden. What do you think happens today if a president puts out a card like that for all the kids of the United States? See, this is what our presidents did for years and years and years. And they weren't considered Christian nationalists because we had a free nation. You've got to choose your faith. You've got to choose your form of government. Today, just supporting what we have been, what made us great, makes us a Christian nationalist. That's crazy. And that's the, the new term that's out there. So going back to this, looking over it, the problem we have today is we don't know the scriptures. We can't say how the scriptures apply to economics, how they apply to criminal justice, how they apply to justice, how they apply to... We don't know the scriptures. As a matter of fact, we do a lot of work with pollsters. George Barner is a very good friend. You'll find that as of last year, only 4% of Americans have a biblical worldview. 
Only 4% of Americans can put Bible verses beside economics or beside education or beside military or beside immigration. We don't know what the Bible says about most of those topics. As a matter of fact, when it comes to Christians, you'll find that only 9% of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. We have a nation that stopped reading the Bible. Even Christians are getting away from reading the Bible like we used to back in public schools. That was something we read every day in public school. A lot of Christians don't even read it today in private life. So when you look at where we are, the biblical literacy we have today, it's evident in our institutions. You remember the three institutions God created? Genesis 1, 2, 3, he creates the family. And God made them male and female. They had children. God said, this is good. It's a family. When we were a biblical nation, we didn't have any questions about the definition of family. But today our academics do. If you go to help a professor, you'll find that they list 81 different genders in America now. We've lost our brains. Uh, I am a cowboy from Texas. I can take any one of you to my ranch in Texas, and every one of you can accurately identify the gender of every critter I've got there, and it's not going to be hard to do. It's a really easy thing. It, it's not complicated. The more secular we become, the crazier we become, the more we lose common sense. In addition to that, the second institution God created is Genesis 9, the institution of civil government. God created civil government before he created the church. When Noah got off the ark after all the turmoil and havoc and God said, let's just start again, first command God gives him, Genesis 9, 6, he says, okay, Noah, here's the way it's going to be. Whoever sheds man's blood, by him will man's blood be shed. That is capital punishment. That's the first. It's, the Hebrew scholars call it the Noahide laws. There were seven categories of laws that God gave Noah. That's the origin of civil government. It came from God. He said, we're not going to have this turmoil in the world, world anymore. Here's what we're going to do with certain behaviors and certain crimes. That's where civil government comes from. And the church is the next one. We know the church, the, the, the God established the church. So these, these are the three institutions God's given us. And Christians can do pretty well with family and church, but not nearly as well with government. i um, give you an example. If I take you back to the guy we talked about earlier, John Locke, he's the third most cited individual. John Locke, he is responsible for this work, the two treaties of government. This is what the founding fathers used in writing the declaration. As a matter of fact, this man over on the left here, Richard Henry Lee. Richard Henry Lee is the guy who made the motion for the Declaration of Independence. He's kind of the father of that whole movement to have the declaration. And he said the declaration was, quote, copied from Locke's two treatises on government. According to Richard Henry Lee, the, the two treatises on government, that's where we got the Declaration of Independence. You know what's interesting about the two treatises of government? John Locke, in a book that's less than 400 pages long, and in, in, in a book that's less than an inch thick, cites the Bible over 1,500 times to show the proper operation of civil government. How many Christians can come up with a dozen verses on civil government today? That little book's got more than 1,500. God's not silent about civil government, but we backed out of that process. We've allowed the other side to tell us we shouldn't be involved in what God says we should be involved with. So what you see is all of these all of these areas, we need to be involved in all of them. So the question is, what do we do now? Let me quickly take you through some things that we can do. Uh, when you go back to when the Supreme Court took out prayer and Bible reading in 63, they said, you know, the, the First Amendment, uh, and by the way, you may have seen that there was a decision by the, by the, the legislature and Supreme Court in Hawaii about a month ago where they said we've evolved past the Constitution. So they passed a law that was absolutely explicitly against the word in the Constitution. That's all, right. That's all right. We've evolved past the Constitution. That's what the court said back here. This is, we've evolved past the First Amendment. So they came up in a case called Lemon versus Kurtzman with what's now known as a lemon test. The lemon test said if you want to know whether a religious activity is constitutional, because once they took prayer and Bible out, everything else got sued. I mean, here came nativity scenes, here came crosses, anything that was religious. Oh, if we can't have prayer and Bible, let's get everything out of society that's religious. And there were so many cases the court said, all right, let's give you a test. How about using the First Amendment? No, 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 we don't use that. We're going to use the lemon test. And so the lemon test got a three-pronged test. It said the best way for you to know whether a religious activity in public is constitutional the number one test is, is the purpose of that religious activity primarily secular? Now, primarily, if I go back here to primarily secular, can you name a religious activity whose primary purpose is secular? No. By definition, that's oxymoronic. If it's religious, it's religious. It's not primarily secular. That's why we have lost virtually every case for essentially 40 years, because we can't meet the standard of a religious activity being primarily secular. We, we can't do that. So what you find is in 2019, we started having justices who started to read the Constitution of the United States, and three decisions came out that changed the whole landscape of America. The first one was the Bladensburg case. This case said, hey, this is a World War I memorial erected to kids who died in World War I by the mothers, and it's a cross. 
And, you know, if we were to use the lemon test, we would have to take this down because the primary purpose of that cross is not secular. You could have made a pyramid. You could have made an orb. You could have used some other shape. Having a cross is not primarily secular, but we don't think we should be tearing that cross down. We, we think that's the wrong thing. So the court at that time said, we really need to go back. And here's what they said. We want to go back to the point where the longstanding religiously expressive monuments, symbols, and practices requires a strong presumption of constitutionality. They said, we're going back to the place that if we've been doing this in America for a while, we're going to assume it's constitution. If we've been having prayer at schools for a while, we did that for three centuries, Bibles. So they said, our new presumption is if it's been part of the fabric of American life, we're going to presume it's constitutional. Then in 2022, three years later, there's a situation arose in Boston where Boston has three flagpoles. And on one of the flagpoles, they fly flags for any group that wants it. Well, they refused to fly a Christian flag. They flew more than 200 different flags for every group you can think of. But they said, no, no, can't have a Christian flag because the primary purpose of flying a Christian flag is not secular. So that, that violates the lemon test. And the court said, yeah, if you, lose lemon, if you use the lemon test, we would have to say that you can't fly that flag. But in a 9-0 unanimous decision, liberals and conservatives came together and said, no, 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 you got to fly the Christian flag. You can't keep the Christian flag from flying. And they said, we, we had this limit decision. They said the limit decision was issued during a bygone era when this court took a more freewheeling approach to legal text. In other words, 30 years ago, when we were all a bunch of judicial activists and we didn't read the Constitution, we came up with new tests that weren't constitutional. We're not there anymore. So liberals and conservatives said, no, 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 you can't exclude Christianity from the public square. You, you just can't do that. And then the real turning point came in the case in 2022 with Coach Kennedy. Coach Kennedy uh, in Bremerton had the school said, you can't pray after a football game by yourself. And the court said, you know, the reason you can't do this is because of the limit test. The court said, we are overturning the limit test. It is no longer to be used in jurisprudence at all. Now, what that meant was that 7,300 previous court cases have now been vacated. So with 7,300 previous court cases now out the door, what can be done now? Well, I'll tell you some of what can be done. One thing is you can put... Put yourself on offense. If you remember the Proverbs 20, 21, 22, the Bible says very simply, it says a wise man attacks the city of the mighty and tears down the stronghold in which they trust. A wise man does what? Oh, a wise man attacks. Oh, a wise man goes on offense. Christians have been on defense for a long time. A wise man goes on offense and tears down the stronghold in which they trust. They've been trusted in the lemon test. It's time to tear the lemon test down. The court said it's gone, but it's not gone unless we put that into practice. So what happens is you take that lemon test that happened. When you take it out, you don't, you know you can put Ten Commandments back in, in public now? In case you didn't know, Tennessee on Friday just passed a state law to put the Ten Commandments back in every classroom in Tennessee. Now... That law is going to be upheld because the limit test is gone, not to mention the fact that, did you know that the U.S. Supreme Court has 57, 57 depictions of the Ten Commandments in the U.S. Supreme Court? Are you going to tell me a kid at school can't see what's hanging in the U.S. Supreme Court? Are you kidding me? See, if you go on the offense, this stuff starts happening. We have a network of legislators all over the nation, about 1,000 legislators. We're in all 50 states. These guys are saying, okay, let's take the stuff with the lemon test and get this gone. So Ten Commandments, you'll see them coming back. You need to be aggressive with that too. You need to do that in your local schools. You need to go to your principal and say, hey, I don't care what the school board attorney says. The Supreme Court has said we can do this kind of stuff. In the same way, you'll find memorial crosses. We had memorial crosses whenever someone got killed. I remember a highway patrolman in Utah got killed. They put up a cross on the highway, and the court said, no, that's not secular or take it down. You can put memorial crosses back up. That's fine now because they came down in the limit test. In the same way, well, we've lost it. It has gone away. But I'll keep going to other things that you can do. Other things you can do, you can have prayer in schools if the students start the prayer. You can have prayer at football games. You can have prayer at graduations. You can have, but it's got to be the students' leader. Right now, teachers don't have that right, but students do have that right. Other things you can do is you, you can go back, for example, there are thousands of scientists now that are into, into what's called intelligent design. That's a debate you can now have in schools again. You don't have to do just evolution only. As a matter of fact, the Founding Fathers have extensive treatises on how that 
that from a scientific standpoint, evolution makes no sense. Daniel Webster, his senior paper at Dartmouth in 1801 was over evolution versus creation. This is not a Charles Darwin argument that we've had since 1959. This is an argument we've been having for hundreds of years. You can go back and doing that. Nativity scenes, we have a federal holiday. We celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and we can't celebrate that holiday in schools when it's a federal calendar? Of course you can. It used to be that, oh, Christmas, that, that needs to be secular because Jesus is too religious. So let's have Santa Claus and let's have reindeer and let's have not anymore. You can go back to having choir presentations in your schools that are just Christmas carols. You can go back to singing Joy to the World, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. There are so many things that can be done, but the only way they're going to get done is if we go on the offense. School districts all across the country are electing new school board members now. That's a big thing of parents wanting different school board members. Give them something they can do. And by the way, when they do this, I guarantee you, you're going to have a lawsuit because the other side is going to come. Hey, for the last 50 years, you haven't been able to. That's right. But for the previous 200 years, you could do it. And in the last five years, you can do it again. So you're right. For 50 years, we couldn't do it. But we can do it now. And we're willing to fight for that. So there are three legal groups. Let me give you real quick. They will represent you for free in all school districts, city councils, wherever. If you'll go to First Liberty, if you go to Liberty Council, if you go to Pacific Justice Institute, and I'll throw in Alliance Defending Freedom, those four groups do this as a ministry. We have a case right now in Washington, D.C. over this very stuff, and they, we just need cases to happen. So be courageous. Be strong. Stand up. Defend your kids. Defend their faith. We've got so much history on our side. The Bible is what made America. Don't get intimidated by people who are going to call you a Christian nationalist for doing this. You're just a traditional red-blooded American who wants to see America be great again. This is what Democrats and Republicans believe for hundreds of years. We're not the crazy ones. Uh, if you're interested in this, there's a book table out by the concession stand. We've got a lot of material. God bless you guys. See you later.